Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Outside Looking In, the podcast series where I talk about 29 other teams with somebody from that market who covers that team and also get their perspective on the Raptors. So at the end of it all, you know, you get 29 different people's ideas on the Raptors, hopefully forming some sort of consensus. Last year it was wrong for what it's worth. And you get to learn about the league at large. Today, the Philadelphia 76ers who have a uniquely shared past with the Raptors that (laughs) continues to strengthen and uh, to talk about them with me, Jackson Frank, who has been on this podcast talking about the Sixers, the NBA at large, a bunch of times, um, the best of the best. You can find him over at Dime Up Rocks and Liberty Ballers. Jackson, my friend, how are you? Doing well. I'm excited to uh, excited to talk some Raptors and Sixers, a couple of teams that maybe there's not as much enthusiasm entering the year as there has been in, in prior seasons, but you know, you're always going to find things. I'm sure by December will be plenty of things that are super exciting about both teams, even if they're not necessarily reflected in the idealized win-loss records. Okay, so first thing, Nick Nurse is the coach of the 76ers. How do you feel about that? Were you like, hell yeah, we got Nick? Or what's the reaction? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i intrigued by it. I think I had a tweet at the end of the year once, either right before Doc got fired or, you know, shortly after, but... Uh, I thought he did a pretty dang good job last year. I think in prior years, you could point to their playoff flameouts as as a pretty strong correlation, maybe some of the things he did or didn't do. But last year, I thought he was pretty good. Um, but I also recognize that that Nurse is is a better coach, I would say, just kind of based on what we know you know, from the outside. There's so many internal things that are tough to evaluate if we don't, you know, we're not privy to them. But uh, I'm excited to see what he can do. It seems like you know maybe he had, I don't want to say overstay his welcome, but it was a good time for him to depart from Toronto after some of the good things he did and some of the places he struggled. But uh, yeah, I'm curious to kind of see what, you know, some of the defensive creativity. It, it always helps to have a guy like Joel Embiid. I know Joel's defensive intensity and performance has kind of ebbed and flowed the last few years as he's really kind of taken a big step offensively. Um, but curious to see what we can do there. And I, But I do think even, you know, as I'm rambling a little bit or just kind of opining on it, like Dan Burke was a pretty uh, interesting and creative guy uh, for the Sixers. He was their D coordinator under Doc the last few years. So uh, I do kind of wonder like how much more creativity we're going to see, because I do think the Sixers were, were pretty good in that department. That was just a fairly limited roster at times, especially once Ben Simmons was traded. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to kind of see what he can do on both ends. I know he's talked a lot about having high hopes for Joel and kind of demand a lot from him defensively. And I think that could be for the best, especially if there's leaps in other ways from different guys offensively that maybe lighten a load a bit for him. Um, as much as you can, you know, given the fact that James Harden is not going to be around. Well, I think that Nick Nurse, as far as the on-court stuff, the, you know, the, like, B-lob stuff, baseline out-of-bounds plays, the sideline out-of-bounds plays, the ATOs, they've been really strong for the Raptors. And also, I think one of the main things about Nick Nurse has been that he's helped achieve higher-end outcomes for what seems from the outside looking in, like, more limited rosters. And the Raptors, of course, that completely fell apart. And I would say from my coverage and talking to people around the team, players, et cetera, that a lot of what happened with Nurse is that it was a little bit grading towards the end. It was interpersonal stuff. That doesn't mean he doesn't know how to coach the hell out of a basketball team. And you'd have to assume he's not going to be grading or having the bad interpersonal stuff within the first couple of years with the 76ers. Some coaches just don't have the longevity, like the adaptability over rosters. But as far as getting Nick Nurse in Philly to coach like an out and out superstar, the the reigning MVP, I mean, I think Philly has to probably feel good about it there. And on the other side of things, Raptors fans feel good about him being gone. I think it's there's a chance at a win win here, which is, I guess, all you can hope for. Um, Does the interpersonal stuff bother you at all hearing about it or anything like that? I think it's, it's a really, I I found that whole situation pretty fast and I can't say I read every, you know, ins and outs details, but to me, I think it was a very cyclical thing. And I wrote about some of the the Raptors defensive regression last year because until they acquired, reacquired Jakob Pertl, they never really had a defensive anchor Mm -hmm. to kind of build a defense around. And I think that made things fickle. And because they were flying around a lot and ha- trying to create turnovers to both help their offense and defense, it, it was a style that did kind of 
was physically taxing, and I think you led to some injuries and, and, and absences, which hurt the consistency and the cohesion of the defense. Uh, and I can see why that maybe not wouldn't be the most enjoyable style to play. Maybe you feel that like maybe the, the coach doesn't always have your best interest at heart physically. I don't know that's how they feel, but I can see if that's the sort of thing where you're always asked to fly around and you're super sore and your limbs are bothering you uh, a lot. Um, but with the Sixers, you have that, right? With Joel, right? You have a guy where you can funnel things to. Uh, and so maybe there's a little less of, of that going around. And then you have another, you have a different style, you know, off the bench with Paul Reed. I know, Seems like Nick Nick Nurse has pretty big aspirations for Paul Reed, and I think that's reasonable. He's a pretty funky player. Um, who I think you've seen take a lot of strides the last couple of years. Um, so th- that would be interesting if he is the backup five. I know they have a lot of centers in the roster. Uh, you know there are rumors that maybe you know I know PJ Tucker could be gone in the James Harden trade. Maybe they get funky and start Paul Reed at the four, give you some more size and range there. I don't know exactly what, what might happen, but that's something that's a possibility. So maybe you have a different style still at backup five. You know maybe you go Mo Bamba. Uh, I think that might be their only other backup centers a lock to be on the roster. Montrez is on it, but he's, you know, mm-hmm. tested torn meniscus, unfortunately. I think Phil Petrushev is a, a non guaranteed camp deal. Um, there could be one more center that I'm missing. They're all kind of blend together. But uh, point being is, I think there's a lot more, you know, just with Joel being, you know, existing, there's a lot less kind of taxing style where you can funnel things into one kind of foundational piece defense so it doesn't rely on everyone to, you know, force a turnover every play because you're going to get your butts kicked on the defensive glass, which admittedly the Sixers are a great <laughs> rebounding team. Um, I think that's honestly one of Joel's biggest defensive weaknesses is kind of the rebounding there. But uh, yeah, so short short answer would be no, I don't really worry about the interpersonal relationships because I do think it's maybe kind of a, you know, there's an easier situation here with Joel there to kind of be a foundational player and the anchor of something and doesn't require everyone to fly around for 47, 48 minutes tonight. Mm-hmm. Dwayne Dedman is a guy who's kind of been toggling like effective season, ineffective season, effective <laughs> season. So I guess maybe, maybe he factors in, maybe not. But as you mentioned, uh, defensive identity, reacquiring Pirtle to find it, which they definitely did. I think they had a top six defense through the rest of the season. The Raptors... I'm sure you're quite aware of how they project to have struggles offensively. Like just looking at that roster, it's easy. But to focus on the defense, this is a question I've been asking everybody. What do you think the floor and the ceiling is? And we'll go by defensive rating ranking. So you don't have to say like, oh, it'll be a 111, but you know, the top 12, top four, whatever you think it might be. Yeah, it's it's tough because I mean, like, you know, two years ago, I thought Fred was really, and I know he's on the roster anymore, but two years ago, I thought he was very, very good as a point of attack guy and it helped with the nail. Those hands you know, are still incredible, but you really saw some lateral movement regression last year and that that really hurt them, especially pre, pre-Purtle trade mm-hmm. um, because, you know, it's it's just, it was just such an important part of their, their defense. Um, but I do, I do like the style they have now. Like I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if they can be a top five or six unit again. The offense might be pretty tough just because yep. you're in a sticky situation with the ball handling and, and kind of maybe where you, I would like to see where Scotty's at in year three in terms of his progression as, as a creator and a handler. Um, but I do like that they have a little more leeway to still maybe run some of that risk taking without being like, okay, if I don't get the steal or whatever, like we don't have any side and side. You've got Yaka, who's very good, very light on his feet. He's not a guy that most people think of as like a super mobile player, but he is really good in short, small spaces covering ground uh, and is, you know, very good about kind of protecting the rim in that regard as well. So I think you have a pretty nice foundation with OG, Pascal, and and Jakob, and I expect Pascal to be in a more suitable long-term role. I think he was asked to do a, a ton of stuff last couple of years, you know, without a, without a, a traditionally sized center. Um but I also see a world where because Pascal is asked to do so much offensively with Fred now gone, that maybe he isn't quite up to par in that roaming role. Uh, and OG is is a very, very good you know wing defender, but maybe he and Jakob aren't enough to counter at that. And I don't know where Scotty's at. I think Scott is a guy who, like, I, through two years, you know, you've watched much more of him, but I've watched a decent amount. I don't ever really have a great feel for who he is defensively. I, I have an idea of who he can be, and I see those flashes, but I also have an idea of who he can be in a negative sense. So um, in my eyes, I see top five, six, seven is the ceiling, but I also see a world where they're, 
you know, 19th, 20th, 21st, new coach, you know, we talked about cohesion or the lack of it last year. There's a chance that maybe that takes a while for them to figure that out with, you know, with the new coach there. Um, but, I, but I'm excited to, to, to watch them. I think it's a really, you know, interesting way to go about things um, with, with all this wing size. And I know that it hasn't always looked good offensively, but, you know, they were a pretty competent team post portal acquisition last year. So um, I think it's a defense that, I don't know if it's necessarily exactly the same, but I could see it kind of being similar at times to what the Nets looked like post post mm-hmm. uh, KD and Kyrie trades, where you've got a good anchor in Claxton, you've got a great point of attack guy in Mikel, you know, OG and Pirtle, you know, uh, those are the parallels there. But maybe like you don't have like not every piece of the of the puzzle is is really good. Maybe you're not el- elite elite uh, because of a lack of cohesion you know, or an inconsistent cohesion. So. Um, that's kind of how I see it. So I think there's a wide variance for this this roster defensively, but I certainly see pathways to where it's one that people aren't really enjoying to, to play on a nightly basis. Yeah, I think uh, I think we're aligned on the ceiling. I I'm not as um, I don't see the bottom falling out as heavily. I think in the NBA, a really easy pathway to good defense recently has been playing quite big during the regular season anyway, and they'll be pretty big on defense at least with that starting lineup and. I think that the defensive context will be very helpful for, as you said, Pascal, but also Scotty. I do, since a lot of the people I talk to are more so covering their own teams, but you have such like a, you know, a broad, um, such a broad history of covering the league at large. You've written about Scotty specifically. I know you've said like there's things you want to learn about his game, but since I have someone here who has covered Scotty before written features on him, where are you on Scotty heading into year three? Yeah, I think... I think I feel pretty similarly to where I did last year, honestly, because I wasn't as high after his rookie year. I thought he was sure. very good. I thought he was clearly an all-deserving, you know, uh, all-rookie guy, but I preferred Mobley in year one. I think the strides that someone like Franz Wagner took in year two sure. um, as a finisher, a driver, gave, like I already, I preferred him in year one, but I think just the development from him in year two kind of solidified my preference for him over Scotty. Um, but he's still a guy that I think is a top five or six player in that, in that class, which to me is not a slight, I like this yep. class a lot. I think I'm really excited to see what Kate Cunningham can do in year. There could, year. there could be five or six all-stars and yeah. like three or four all NBA players. Certainly. Yeah. And you, you know, you look at a guy like Trey Murphy, who took a lot of strides. You know, I, I, I don't know if I necessarily have him in that, that's tier sure. of Scotty necessarily. And he's obviously going to miss, you know, some time, unfortunately with the, the meniscus injury, but uh, yeah, and you know, I'm curious what Jalen Green looks like in a in a better context as well. But I have Scotty, like I I like I like the passing line, I like the connectivity. I am curious if he can kind of broaden his shot making sure. pathways. I think you know, and I you know, we talked about this last year when I was writing about him. One of my my criticisms is a lot of his creation comes from his back to the defense, which is something that can work. But one of the ways that Pascal really took a leap is getting more comfortable with his handle, being more comfortable facing up and attacking the defense that way and creating. That's such an important thing because if you have your back to the defense, you can't read things as fluidly as you can if you're facing them up. So And defensive rotation you, is easier on that end if because yeah. it's slower. It's You can't mm-hmm. get to the rim as quickly, so rotations mm-hmm. are easier to manage, mm-hmm. um, as both as yeah. covering cutters and as far as like providing help to the, the rim. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, but I but I still like a lot of the connective playmaking of him. I think he's a guy that really can just crush mismatches yeah. inside. You know, you saw Pascal as one of the reasons Pascal has been so good the last few years. He, he punishes them, and I think Scotty is in a similar vein. I just do wonder, like, and not not to run us silly, but I do wonder kind of how long it takes wherever Scotty is playing to have like a true bona fide number one option that he can play off of a, a guy that can draw traps, get him in the short roll, have him run some pick and roll stuff to get to the short roll um, as a, both a floater and a playmaking option. Uh, so he is a guy that I just, I just don't know if the offensive context the last couple of years has really been suitable to see like his, his foremost ceiling or get hints of it. I think we've, you know, I guess we've gotten, you know, previews, but I just don't think we've consistently seen him in a role that, I think is most conducive to his success. Whereas you look at a guy like, like Evan Mobley and maybe like hasn't all, like maybe the lack of spacing is an issue at times, but playing with a guy like Garland and then a guy like Garland and Mitchell, you're in a pretty dang good spot. So, and with uh, Jared Allen on the defensive end too. Yeah, exactly. And you look at, you look at a guy like Franz who 
kind of really gets to blend, you know, on and off ball scoring because they have a Paolo, a Markel Foltz, uh, you know, a Wendell Carter Jr. who can act as kind of a, a perimeter and, and a high post hub. So uh, I, I just, it's tough for me to really get a read on Scotty in terms of kind of where I see his ceiling, but I do like kind of the mismatch scoring, the playmaking, the process. And I think the processing to me, or the decision making of his processing took a, took a leap last year. I mm-hmm. think that's that's an area I think he really has an edge on on Mobley, which is interesting to me because like that's something I really liked out of Evan Mobley in in year as a prospect in year one. And maybe that's me harm like harping too much on the playoffs, but his decision making was not particularly good in the short role against the Knicks, uh, and that's somewhere somewhere where I think Scotty has become quite good. Uh, and I just kind of wonder how often they can he can be put in those situations next year. Um, but Scott is a guy that I really do enjoy as kind of a complimentary offensive player, and I, I kind of wonder what sort of improvements he can make to become more of a guy who can slide as a complimentary and a, and a, a primary, because I think that's something that Franz does really well. You know, I keep kind of juxtaposing, you know, Scott sure. to do his, but I think it's I think it's something worth talking about because, you know, it is something that tends to kind of be focused on a lot when, when we discuss these young guys. So to me, that's the next step is, okay, if Scotty can't necessarily always be a complimentary player because of the surrounding context, can he be someone who's a little more comfortable facing up, facing the defense, getting to tilt with his size, kind of blending, backing down and facing up a little more? That's that's where I would like to see him make improvements offensively. When I think of Scotty, the transition, like he's tremendous in transition, both as a guy filling the lane and especially as this, a decision maker, like he's – always or like 95 percent of the time going to find the optimal pass that's a big deal um when defenses are in a in rotation you talk about that processing speed once again a guy who has the ability to put a ball through a pinhole and a guy who reads the defense and finds the optimal pass and defensively he started to win enough minutes i know i prefer him in the roamer role i prefer him away from the ball using his length to muck things up and especially to help out on the defensive glass and maybe some rotational stuff at the rim. That's where I like him best. Um, The on-ball stuff, we'll see. I think all of that mixed with his ability to kind of bully on mismatches, um, to score on broken plays, that all to me says, and the fact that I think he is one of the best playmakers in the world, uh, not quite reflected in the assist totals, but when I did that piece looking at advantages or advantage to assists, he's just giving guys such easy looks. Um, I think all of that, kind of keeps him on that trajectory towards all-star the initiation stuff is where you really were going to see it we'll see a fair bit of it this year attempts at it whether that all nba ceiling is there and it's it's not something he's his skill set has not lended towards being successful at really so far we'll see what he works on in the summer what he comes back with and it's interesting the way i've talked about scotty for a while the way you're talking about him is as this complementary role, kind of more so in the vein of a, a bigger wing or a smaller big as far as dribble handoff, you know, short roll hub, complementary stuff. But Scotty and the Raptors, there's messaging around the point guard aspect of it. A guy who plays point guard. Mm. We'll see how that happens, but I do want to shift over to the point guard aspect of the 76ers. James Harden, like an unbelievable talent. Truly a very special playmaker, a guy who can obviously score 37 points per game the one year, despite scoring 21 or 22 points per game, is still like one of the better scores in the NBA, despite being more limited because of past injuries kind of climbing up on him. But, you know, publicly called out Daryl Morey, <laughs> called him a liar, said he will not be part of the organization. I just have to know what you think of that situation because it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean... To me, Harden just strikes me as a guy who hasn't ever quite necessarily like figured out kind of a firm standing what he wants the twilight of his career to look like. And I don't think that's, you know, I don't think that's a, what's, I think think it's a completely normal way to be. Um, But I think it's, you know, like he was such a huge part of the why Embiid was such a dominant scorer last year and, uh, and why they had a, you know, before the playoffs, at least where they were pretty up and down, some of which was Embiid's injuries, Harden post Achilles thing in March, never quite got back to what the all NBA style he looked at before that. Um, but why for the most of the regular season, they had a dominant offense and they were top three or four in offensive rating once Harden came back. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think it's such a weird situation and I don't think we're ever going to get the full story. 
uh, on that, it does seem, I think it might've been Amic or maybe it was Shelburne at this point. I think they've both written things, but I'm, I'm starting to recall which was which, but I think it came out that he, that Harden was calling him a liar in terms of like, he expected a trade after the opt-in. Uh, and I just, I don't know kind of to what degree Maury guaranteed or didn't guarantee things. So it's tough to know there. Uh, but in terms of how I, like, I, I, I just don't, I try not to get caught up in that very much because everything I've read and he's in Harden has said is he's not going to play for the Sixers again. Uh, assuming, you know, as long as Maury is around, it doesn't seem like Maury is going to get canned anytime soon. So I analyze this team through the scope of, okay, Harden won't be on it. Um, they're going to be a lot worse for all of his inconsistencies in the playoffs. And I'd have no issue with anyone criticizing them. I think they're worth criticism. He's I've just a massive work. engine of offense. Like no he way He was just around. really, really important. He was really important to them. And uh, the guard initiating beyond him is not particularly good. I think Maxie's a very nice player. Uh, but part of the reason they were so good, or at least pretty good before they acquired Harden a year and a half ago was because they also had Seth Curry. And you can say whatever you want, like, okay, it's Seth Curry, but to have two guards who can play well off of them be like that in contrasting ways, they don't really have that. D'Anthony and Melton has tried to kind of test some ball handling stuff throughout his career. It's never really worked. Patrick Beller, we know, was kind of a small wing at this point in his career. Um, maybe this is the year Jane Springer puts it together. He looked pretty good in summer league, especially as the games went on. Um, but he's kind of a funky creation style too. If we're talking, you know, a different, he's a different player than Scotty, but kind of the same, you know, just in terms of it's an atypical mm-hmm. you know, style of advantages, trying to create advantages and with that strength. And especially as a six, four guard compared to a six, eight, six, nine wing. Um, but yeah, so it's just a, it's just a strange spot for them to be. And I think the loss of George Niang is pretty huge too. Uh, he opened up a lot of stuff for them in terms of just what sort of lineups worked um, because he was such a better floor spacing threat than Tobias or PJ. Um, Jalen McDaniels, you know, obviously the guy was the Raptors now, but his kind of blend of cutting an okay passer gave you a lob threat at that kind of that three flash, slash four position and some good wing defense. Like I think he's going to be lost, even if he wasn't a huge loss in the playoffs because he fell out of the rotation in the second round. I think he's a guy that gives them some really nice minutes post trade deadline. Um, so it's, I just, I think they're going to be a lot worse. Like I just, I just do. I think they were, you know, a team that again, they only made the second round, but I do think they were one of the four or five best teams last year. Um, I know they only made it to the top eight, but the Celtics made it to the precipice of, uh, you know, the finals and they, they made it to the precipice of beating the Celtics, um, you know, seventh game, notwithstanding, of course, but yeah, and I think I think Harden had a lot to do with it. I think George Niang, you know, his versatility of lineups that he allowed for them had a lot to do with that as well. Um, and I just I just struggled to see this team being anything more than kind of middle of the road, barring another big leap from Embiid or a big leap from Max. You know, you know that's kind of the center, the center, the center of attention is what player is Maxi? Can he go from high end starter to someone who deserves All Star consideration? I don't know. I see the pathway there. I think he's going to get a lot more ball handling responsibilities uh, as the roster is going to dictate. But I don't think to this point in his career, he's shown enough as a playmaker to instill a lot of faith. He has gotten better. It was interesting. He got, he was definitely making strides with, right before Harden was traded. Um, so there's a chance that he's kind of able to build on that. But uh, yeah, it just I just know that Harden's going to be a huge loss. Kind of the ease of touches he provided uh, Joel. Um, was really important to Joel being able to do what he does to score. I wouldn't say effortlessly, but he dropped 35 a night a lot of times in very non-stressful uh, mm-hmm. manners because of what Harden allowed and because of how comfortable he was with playing with Harden in his own you know, greatness that shouldn't be discounted. Yeah, Raptors fans will be perfectly you know, aware of how Harden helped shift the floor for Maxi because that's what... <laughs> The, the playoff series was obviously Embiid is firmly entrenched in any kind of success the 76ers <laughs> have had and as we talked about before the podcast the 76ers in 2018 19 the four best teams were the Bucks the Raptors the Warriors and the 76ers the next year you know more trouble with injuries and like the Simmons and Embiid stuff maybe they weren't one of the four best but it seems like almost every year of the past four or five years it was easy to convince yourself that, you know, if they get the healthy Embiid run, if the guys around Embiid, and especially once Harden was there, kind of like find their form too, it, I wouldn't, nobody would sneeze at a, a championship because like it, it could end up there. This is the first season where I look at the roster and I've, I'm a guy who has 
consistently been like, yeah, the 76ers could do it very liberally. And this is the first time in years where I've just been like, there's, I don't see it. No way, no how. Um, what's, what's the like positive aspect of it though, I guess, like a team falling out of the championship bid. What, what positives do you look for then? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, but I, and this isn't to put pressure on him, but I do think a lot of it is going to come down to what sort of player does Tyrese Max look like in year four, right? Like he's, he's done some good stuff as a creator. I think he is a, he is a capable creator. I don't think he's a guy you want running a ton of your offense. He can still struggle with traps. He is the rallies is a six, one, six, two point guard yeah. uh, or combo guard, I guess is kind of maybe a more fitting term for his skill set. Um, and I think a lot of people who are optimistic have talked like cited his numbers without Harden on the floor, but like, I just, I can't get there. I've watched enough of him to know that he's a little bit kind of limited in his creation style. It's a lot of step back threes, pull up threes, which are really good. He's a very, very good shooter. One of the yep. 10 or 11 best probably in, in, in the world, you know, at least from the men's side. Um, but he doesn't really have that mid range comfort. I think if there's anything that I've learned the last few years watching playoff basketball so intently, it's how comfortable you have to be in that mid range area. You don't necessarily be a great mid range scorer, but you have to be comfortable operating there. Uh, a guy like Jalen Brunson, a guy like Jamal Murray, um, and on the inverse, maybe guys like Dame Lillard and James Harden haven't been as comfortable there, and that's why maybe they've been a little more erratic, you know, in terms of kind of their their variance as playoff players. I think to an extent, and that's where I think Max needs to get more comfortable. Can he can he snake those pick and rolls, keep that defender in jail? Um, can he get that wrap around to, to Embiid? Can he get a lob to Embiid? Things like that. That's kind of where I'm looking for him to take a step. And then also like, and just also mid range shot making, like off the dribble. I think. Um, would kind of be a way to diversify things, really open it up. If teams are going to run you off the arc or go over the top of a pick and roll against you, let's say they're putting the 6'4", 6'5", point of attack guy, you know, they're going to chase you over the top and kind of have that threat of a rear view contest to bother you. Can you kind of use your speed, yep. get to that quick pull up at the elbow or the, you know, the nail uh, and let it happen? I think that's something that Jamal Murray's blended really well. Um, he's a guy that I keep coming back to. I know that he's much more kind of well-built and a little bigger than, than Maxi, but... I think that's the pathway for Max to kind of take that all-star leap. And then on the defensive end, we've seen some pretty good stuff at the point of attack, some good screen navigation, but we've also seen him. He kind of has some of the, the kind of the way that I would call it, maybe like Scotty and, and Ant Edwards syndrome that play too far up at times. And then they get blown by, you know, those are three players of completely different physical dimensions, mm -hmm. but all guys that I think are kind of susceptible to blow bys because of how much pressure they like to apply um he's never going to be a great off-ball defender i think in terms of kind of a low man rotations but i like what he's known as an off-ball chaser some of the stuff he did against max Struess two two se playoff series ago or two seasons ago um was impressive at times because he is pretty physical and he's pretty good around screens and is quick um so that's kind of what the things i'm looking for is can we get some of those flashes to become more of a consistent impact defensively and what can he do as a mid-range player and kind of a, a pick and roll pass or not because he's a good pick and roll player the numbers bail that out, but what can you kind of do to further diversify him as an on-ball scorer uh, is kind of where I'm looking. That would be, I think, where a lot of optimism resides in this team because he's going to have more opportunity uh, and can he capitalize on it in kind of the ways that I think he and everyone who supports him are, are hoping for. To your point about the the comfort in the mid-range, a lot of the Canadian listeners love just watch Shea Gilgis Alexander with Team Canada that ran an NBA-style offense against these tight, tightly wound FIBA defenses. Basically, Team Canada wouldn't have, they would have had tons of runs where they, it's like 14 0 for the other side. Um, they had a couple, but like they would have had so many more if Shea didn't have that shot making and that comfortability in the mid range. It's where defenses will try to funnel you, and it's where defenses are most comfortable putting you. And you can make a defense always uncomfortable if you can always revert to that type of shot making. It's not the ideal shot chart you want, but it is run starters run stoppers and it is you know it's the the oxygen mask for you know offenses that are struggling and, and i think playing off of that too like i said earlier like you don't have necessarily have to be someone who's a prolific shot maker from mm -hmm. there you just have to be someone who's really comfortable operating yeah. there because it is a very threatening place to be if you get two feet in the paint with a live dribble the defense is rightly going to be concerned with you and if you can capitalize on that consistently whether it's a, a skip to the corner a, a look off and a lay down a floater, the pull up, like just different ways to capitalize. It puts you in a really good spot. And that's where I think Maxi has to take a leap. And if he does, I think I could see him as a guy that maybe the Sixers are 
out outperforming their expectations a bit and and beads being on bead and they're on pace for 48 50 wins versus 43 44 and he's getting some all-star considerations it's, it's a really really loaded guard crop in the east uh i mean there's going to be three or four guys who are probably top 30 ish 40 ish players that miss it i think um maybe but one or two less without without Kyrie there this season but uh that's where i think he could kind of make that leap from yeah top 60 ish top 70 ish player above average starter to to someone you're talking about as a bona fide all-star candidate it's as much as teams know you're trying to inform a certain shot diet a live dribble with two feet in the paint even if a guy's like you know it's 15 or 14 feet that big man trying to navigate like do i step up the guy's pinching in from the wing like how far do i pinch in and if you just you hit two floaters or two little pop shots to start a game, the defense is going to start freaking out, and they're like, they just can't leave you to it. It really, and with a live dribble, like maybe it's like a hesitation and a push into space, you can get to six or seven feet very quickly. It's, it's not the the best place to take your shots, but it is one of the best places to be on the floor, and that's like mm-hmm. that's the whole crux of it. That is that's also basically why Pascal Siakam has been so good. Um, and has helped try and, you know, lift this Raptors offense out of the, I don't know, Mariana's trench, it seems to occupy, which <laughs> it was bottom five in half court um, efficiency, both of the last two seasons, above average relative to the league with Pascal Siakam on the court, in the half court. He does a very big job there. I have to get your point of view before we talk about the Raptors offense. The Pascal Siakam stuff, uh, there's been... A, there's been talks from the Raptors, interest from the Raptors in moving on. Um, there's been interest from other teams in getting him. The disconnect is obviously the price that is paid, which is, you know, that's the whole trade thing. But I'm curious from from your point of view, what are your thoughts on Pascal and his future with the Raptors based on what you've heard or read? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's such a strange place to be, right? Because it seems like he's reportedly willing to sign an extension with the Raptors. Uh but not with other teams. The Raptors are like, well, if he stay with us, why would we, why would we trade him for a one-year rental? But then other teams are like, why would we trade for a one-year rental? So it's really a, I understand why there hasn't been a ton of, you know, traction. I know that, you know, there's been, he's been linked to the Hawks and there's been some talks there, but nothing where it's like, you know, it doesn't feel like we're on the verge of anything anytime soon. Uh, I, I would love Pascal in a setting that maybe deprioritizes him a little bit offensively. Um, just kind of, I would say somewhere in between where he is now and where he was on the title team, I think is a really, really nice spot for him, you know, in terms of kind of how good an offense can be. I think Pascal can lead a a pretty solid offense, but I do think there's just a ceiling with some, you know, kind of with things, but uh, I, I like him in Toronto as well, because I just, I don't think an OG or a Scotty who maybe are seen as kind of the bedrocks of the future are good enough as shot creators and offensive engines to kind of be in those roles right now. You mentioned that Scotty's going to get a lot of reps, and we've seen OG kind of get some reps at times, a second side of pick and roll creator, a mismatch score at times. Um, but I really just do think it would tilt it would tilt to a balance that isn't particularly conducive to positive development for either one of those guys. Um, so I like Pascal a lot in that role. I mean, I don't think he's an inning teeter. Like, I think that's not necessarily a negative term, but I think he's a guy that's just capable of handling such a big workload on both ends. Uh, that he does make a lot of sense to, to keep around. Uh, but at the same time, like if eventually he does open up to the idea of playing elsewhere, and maybe Toronto gets off to a really slow start this year. And as Pascal's in the middle of his prime, he says, you know, I would prefer to maybe play somewhere that is, you know, prioritizing my window rather than, you know, someone like OG or Scotty, which isn't a slide at them, but just as kind of the, what happens when you have kind of divergent timelines with some of your key players. Um, then I could certainly see it in a, a way where he's open to extending elsewhere. But uh, yeah, it's just such a tough spot to navigate from everyone involved. And obviously you, you, you want to you do what pa- I would prefer, whatever Pascal prefers is, is kind of what it's best. But I also would be elated to see him in a place that is maybe a little more likely to make a deep playoff run or make a deep playoff run if he was in the fold. But uh, if he wants to stay in Toronto, then you know so be it. I'll, I'll still be watching him in, in their games. I think um, the, the big thing is that there have been guys who have been traded recently who the team is definitely convinced like this guy is going to make us better. And maybe we're in the, like we reached the second round now 
And, you know, maybe we have a puncher's chance at the Eastern Conference Finals or Western Conference Finals, something like that. But Pascal, there's probably like five or six teams. If he ends up on there, you can really start to convince yourself that there's championship upside. Like him as a two or three is really, really strong. He's obviously a one now, but he's developed into, you know, as far as two way players, especially considering his on ball usage, just really, really good. Um, I think he's underrated league wide, um, maybe may overrated by some in Toronto. Some people who always think that I overrate him, which that's totally fine. But I think of players who are considered being traded, you know, there's guys like DeJounte Murray who have come up. There's guys who get brought up all the time. I think Pascal is one of those guys who could really alter and, you know, a ceiling for a team. Yeah. I think you're looking at a top 20 ish, top 25 player. And it's, it's, it, and I, I know like, you know, there's, there's conflicting factors and agendas that kind of you know, inf- inform how people, you know, rate, rate players, but it is so strange to see a multi-time all NBA guy, a guy who's played a very, very important role in a title team get talked about as like this hypothetical player so often in, in national circles when, again, he's, we've seen him be a 2A or 2B, however you want to dice, you know, dice him up compared to Kyle Lowry on that title team, at least offensively. It kind of felt like they, they share the the load there in different ways and different series, yep. you know, different games as well. Um, yeah, I just, I just think back to like game one of the finals versus game six of the finals, you know, uh, maybe Pascal was more important in game one and then Kyle was more important in game six. Um, and even and even then, I think Pascal, what was it? He 26 and 10 in game six and he hit the game winning floater over Draymond. Like yeah, just yeah. the broken and he's a much, much better player now than he was then even. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's just it's just so weird for people like we don't have a, we don't need a hypothetical to know how he'd fit on a on a high like a high level environment like we've seen it and we don't need to see how he would fit on a kind of a a floor raiser because we've seen that too like or even a very good team that wasn't great but was better like the the bubble raptors right that were sure. a very very good team weren't weren't as good as the title team for obvious reasons without, without Kawhi. Yeah. But we're obviously also better than the Raptors team a year ago that when or when they lost the Sixers in the first round, Pascal made All NBA. Like we've seen kind of him in all these different environments, and yet there's all the. It just seems like a lot of talk about a hypothetical with him, and it's just maybe it's just people are are tired of Raptors fans overrating him, or maybe they're using that bubble the bubble struggles a lot when he was very open about his own mental health issues and kind of the the challenges that was being being in that that the isolated you know situation. So. Uh, yeah, he's really, really good. And if he does get traded, like you said, I mean, you're looking at a the 23rd best player in the NBA who's kind of shown himself to be moldable in a bunch of different roles. Um, so I, I, like I said, I would love to see it. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't want to see it, then you know, I'm not going to be clamoring yeah. for him to be to, to for him to move because I'll still still watch Raptors games uh, and get to watch him do his thing as a really, really good scorer and playmaker and um, a guy whose defense is kind of oscillated as yeah. his, his role on, on offense has, has changed as well, but still a guy who is a positive and, you know, at times a very, very, very big positive. He's uh, for an all NBA wing. He's worn more hats than most, you know, by <laughs> proxy of his draft slot, his G league time, mm-hmm. his development. And while, you know, the potential, like some all NBA wings, they, they come in that, that Paul George form where it's just like, you could convince yourself. It, the sky keeps going higher and higher and higher. Maybe that doesn't exist for Pascal, but um, his ability to slot in next to a wide array of players at this point is it's confusing to me that people talk about him like, you know, he's like a, this ball dominant guy and would never be different. But he kind of does strike me almost as as East Coast Paul George and that he is super scalable and he replaces Paul George's versatile shooting with kind of a versatile driving game, right? Like sure. You can see him attack off the catch. You can see him get downhill with Paul George. You can work off screens. You can work, you know, or work off ball screens off. Uh, you know what I mean? Like yeah, as, yeah. A, as a movement shooter and a pull-up shooter would be a yeah. better way to phrase that. Pascal can run pick and rolls, get to the rim. He can attack off the catch, get to the rim. He can cut, get to the rim. So DHO um, hub stuff too. Yeah. yeah. So I see, I see kind of some parallels there and kind of in that everyone loves Paul George as a scalable player and rightfully so. Uh, but there seem to be more question marks. I do think that it's just kind of a, is the reality is it's easier to kind of envision, oh, this guy can shoot so he can work on and yeah. off the ball, whereas can this guy drive on and off the ball, something that maybe needs a little more uh, close inspection. That's not always the, doesn't always happen in, in analysis. If you have a pretty jumper, people can convince themselves <laughs> of a lot of things about your game. And Pascal's yeah. jumper is effective in the mid-range, middling from downtown. 
and it does not look pretty. And so, you know, it's tough <laughs> yeah. to tough to convince yourself. Like people still think he's like a, a spin move guy, but that's yeah. he, he doesn't go to it very often. He's more of like yeah. a step back, you know, live dribble in the middle of the floor, or get a double, etc. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, the conceptions of his game, I feel, are oftentimes very misplaced. And that doesn't mean people have it wrong as far as like the the outcome, the impact at the end of it all. But it's um, certainly people don't know what he plays like a lot of the time, if you ask them. Um, hmm. As far as the 76ers, I know it's not as exciting to talk about a team that is no longer in the championship. I'm sure like you ask people around it, they will say, yes, we're going for the championship. But have we missed anything? You know, Maxi being the initiator, Embiid, an MVP who hopefully is, you know, a little bit more emboldened in, I don't know, he's an MVP. How much higher do you go? But hopefully there's something in addition with Nurse. Um, what else is interesting about this team, the 76ers, if somebody were, you know, like Raptors fans who I assume hate the team and hate everybody as part of it. But if they somehow <laughs> want to watch it, what, like what should they be looking for? Yeah, well, I do think just even on the back of MB, the reality is like, can he be an MVP level player in the playoffs? We've seen it in spurts, in games, in moments, but never for full playoff run. Maybe that maybe that playoff run only lasts one round, maybe only lasts two rounds again. But like, can he be that level of player? I think is what is most intriguing to me. You know, from that perspective. But I really do think Paul Reed is really interesting to me. Like, I he's a guy that I I wasn't super high on him as a rookie because like he was such a focal point with the blue coats. And then he was, he struggled a lot to adapt to a smaller role as any player would. He didn't play a ton as a rookie, but didn't, didn't tell nurse no compare him to Pascal. He did. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Which is, I, you know, I mean, it's, sure. it's, it's, I, I can't get there, but I do think there are certainly some, some elements that are interesting. Uh, but to me, like he's, he's a great rebounder. He's a really, really good aggressive pick and roll coverage guy. I think nurse is going to like him a lot in that sense, because he's going to be able, he, he just causes so much havoc. Uh, and so like, I, I would like, I am my, not at all opposed to them kind of as much as possible, especially with how prevalent at least one non shooter is during the regular season. Like if they do start Paul Reed, if PJ Tucker gets, gets moved, um, have Paul Reed be the ball screen guy and let him beat Rome. Like have, have him be on non shooter. You saw that. You saw that at, at times the last few years, um, Doc wasn't afraid to do it with him or uh, Ben Simmons. I know they play different roles defensively, but there's kind of a baseline there. So uh, really incredible defensive rebounder. Um, his screening's getting better. You can see him getting more comfortable as kind of a where to where to find his spots offensively as a scorer. I thought his finishing was better last year as well. Um, he's he's a very like confident player. He's a, he's very skilled. And I think maybe some of the the dexterity that he shares with Pascal at that size is maybe some of where. You know, nurse sees parallels. Obviously, the shot making is a big difference, and maybe some of the fluidity as a as a driver, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is massively different. And Pascal, you know, we talked about maybe he doesn't have the most aesthetically pleasing jumper. It's certainly better than, than Paul Reed's, I would say. Um, but Paul Reed's been doing a lot of fun stuff. I'm watching some of these Rico Hines runs, and I know that like that doesn't necessarily reflect what you do in the regular season. But if you're looking for okay, how why would Nurse compare him to Siaka? Maybe some of the stuff. Paul Reed's doing there is intriguing. Um, so that that's kind of what I what I'm looking for. I think he's a guy who's just super in, intriguing to watch, like plays really, really hard, uh, and like has a skill set that isn't really replicated across the roster. Um, other than that, like if I mean I think Jaden Springer maybe being that fourth guard behind Maxi Melton and and Pat Bev could be interesting. Um but there there is a lot of carryover from last year that is going to be minus James Harden and James Harden was a, was a key piece to make everything else work. Yeah. Uh, so like, I, I wouldn't blame people if they felt a little stale about this roster. We know who Tobias is at this point. We know who PJ is. Um, Daniel house is a very fun player, but he kind of is who he is. Uh, I hope he gets to stay in the rotation. I think nurse will like him. He's another guy who plays hard, has some kind of funky driving, passing chops, things like that. Pretty good point of attack defender. Um, but yeah, I think the, the main draw is going to be to Paris Maxine kind of, and then just what does MB look like, um, you know, in nurse's system. But I think a couple of young guys and Jaden Springer and Paul Reed would be the kind of the other, the other reason to maybe tune into the Sixers if you're not as enthused about them and rightfully so compared to prior years. Yeah. Springer heads into battle with the, uh, you know, draft Twitter flag. That's his banner. Um, 
there's there's like a lot of bets were made on him and the start of his career has been obviously way different than many people expected but so much of what makes him interesting is still there and i'd love i'm i'm going to be watching springer minutes like with a, a trained eye because i'm i'm very interested to see a guy like that one of those bully guards how he finds his way and yeah very very interesting player um i think i think then you'll be hoping that the if assuming that Harden ends up in the Clippers, I'm hoping that maybe the return is wing centric rather than guard centric, because I think there's clearly a pathway to where Springer gets buried if they bring in a Norm sure. Powell and a Terrence Mann. Um, because that's like I think, I'm, and I I didn't really watch a ton of Springer in college. Um, that was kind of my last. That was when I transitioned more to NBA full time, but sure. coverage. But uh, I think like, and I like, I think the issue has just been he's played for two seasons on a team that has a lot of really good guard depth. Uh, and that's why he hasn't gotten burned more so than like anything he's done. Uh, so I think if he gets a chance, I would, you know, going to be growing pants. He's never really played real NBA minutes, but um, the point of attack defense, that's a great skill set. The downhill driving, he's a pretty solid passer when he gets to his spots. So yeah, I think if you're, if you're listening to this and you're a Springer enthusiast, you would be hoping for more maybe wing centric uh, options from the Clippers. So maybe a Roko Batum over a man and a, and a Powell, I think would be the, with the hope if you're on the, the Springer Island. Covington back in uh, Philly is kind of <laughs> romantic in a sense, you know, it, uh, you know, they're both at different places than when they left and have traveled, you know, like there's just been a lot of stuff that has happened separately between the two parties, but uh, that would be kind of, that would be kind of fun if Robert Covington was back there. That's where it all, it didn't necessarily all start there for him, but you know, he, a lot of his reputation as an impact player was done in Philadelphia. Uh, any mm-hmm. parting shots on the Raptors before we get out of here, Jackson, any, you know, disparate thoughts, et cetera. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think for me, I really am curious to see what this offensive system can look like. I think, Partly because of personnel, but maybe a little bit because of nurse. I didn't like how how often things kind of devolved into mismatch hunting. I think sure. there's clearly that's clearly a, a strong point of Pascal, OG, and Scotty's games, but it felt like a little too much of that. I know that Raptors fans always were clamoring for some more more involvement between yeah. Freddie and, and Pascal in the pick and roll, whether it was Fred screening or Pascal screening. Uh, but to have a guy like Grady Dick there, to have Gary Trent as well. Uh, can, can you find some lineups where you have some pretty fun sets for them both off the ball, I think could be cool and kind of maybe trying to create some more space for Pascal. If you're running weak side stuff for one of those shooters. Uh, but yeah, that's the big thing to me is kind of what this offensive system looks like and kind of how much can having two presumably very good wing shooters. Obviously we know Gary is a very good wing shooter Mm -hmm. to get to be seen if that translates to the NBA for Grady Dick. But I, I think it will is he has a long standing history of that, but that's kind of what I'm, I think that's what I'm most interested to see is kind of how those two shooters kind of be, can help elevate the offense and maybe acquiesce the lack of a, a true uh, point guard size ball handler. Yeah, I, uh, I'm excited to see because I don't have high hopes for the offense, which means if they find any, you know, modicum of success, they're playing. And like I, I had a long conversation with Caitlin Cooper, who for my money is the best, you know, basketball analyst in doing it. And she had trouble kind of in her head finding like, "Hmm, I wonder what kind of offense they run to make it work, navigating the spacing. And if they do, they're navigating the spacing or the lack of it. And they're kind of bullying in all the right ways. They're being aggressive in all the right ways and finding the right quadrants for the right guys. It's like, that's really unique offense. And if, and unique offense is one of the coolest things to watch in the NBA and presumably, you know, a top 10 defense to pair with it. Um, Fun things. If it works out, Maybe you want to claw your eyes out a little bit sometimes, but I guess we'll see. Jackson, thank you so much for coming on, illuminating myself and the listeners on the 76ers situation, albeit not as exciting as years past. Plenty of things to look forward to. Do um, you want to shout out anything before we get out of here? I don't think so. I appreciate having me on. Uh, I think there are worse teams to pitch than a, a team with Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid, that's right. for sure, but... Uh, in contrast to prior years, yeah, it's certainly not as a uh, as eye catching as as it has been. But yeah, appreciate having me on. I look forward to uh, to chopping it up throughout the year. And uh, yeah, you know, we've got a couple of division rivals and two fan bases who uh, don't have much uh, appre- ad- adoration. I think would probably be the best. There's a lack of adoration, maybe appreciation. There's some of that, but adoration, not much for sure. Yeah, if anybody wants to keep up with the 76ers this upcoming season, at Jack Frank. 
underscore J-I-F. And Jackson, like many writers, if you want to pay attention to their work, everything will end up being linked or plugged on Twitter. So um, feel free to follow him there. And um, yeah, hell yeah. Glad we had the conversation. Listeners, yeah, thanks for listening. Viewers, thanks for viewing. Jackson, thanks for coming on. Everybody, we'll see you. <laughs>